the music what's going on my friends welcome to episode 27 of the get again podcast bringing you the hot takes latest stories and spicy pics on the new york new jersey philadelphia national and international sports hosted by yours truly adam grisani joined this time around by michael cunningham and alex reach you can listen to the podcast right now on soundcloud uh podcast spotify google podcasts and YouTube. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter at Get a Game on P. With all that said, it's time to get a game on. I'm sorry for that um very you know um sambo intro there, Michael and Alex. But if you guys know me, I think you know what the sambo intro is for. Unfortunately, I can see Alex smiling already. You piece of shit. But unfortunately, to his um, and I don't know where my stanza is to his amusement and my um misery. The uh, twenty twenty one Brooklyn Net season has come to an end. What a pity! So has the Sixers season coming <laughs> as well. Yeah, so as the Sixers, but we'll, we'll we'll start with start with the Nets. I mean, this hurts. I mean, this really really hurts. I mean, where do I even begin? I mean, it, it was an amazing game seven. Don't get me wrong. It was a very entertaining game to watch and it was close all the way throughout, but it really, this really, really stings. This is a loss that, um, in my, that, that is really gonna, as a fan is going to stick with me. That is going to stick that, that really, as a fan, is going to stick with me for, like, a very long time. Because there were so many things that, if just that could have gotten this way, and I, that could have won the game. I mean, Kevin Durant had just another unbelievable game. Remember when we were talking about, like, like we need a, whether or not we were going to see another, like, game five performance of Kevin Durant? He gave, gave us that in game seven. He had, like, 48 points, very efficient shooting. I believe he had... What? How many rebounds? I forget. I'll, I'll look up his official stats right when I get the chance. But he was unbelievable, and he came. He came like this close to hitting that. Um, when he hit that unbelievable shot to tie the game, his foot was like just barely on the line. And if it was just like literally like a centimeter, like inch away from the line, like that's it, and that's when the game, and they're in the Eastern Conference Finals, and. But as they say, it's a game of inches, and it just didn't, and it just did not go. Um, and you know, it, it just uh did not go in its way. Like in overtime, you know, um, um, and you could see like in overtime, Kevin Durant like had nothing left. He had clearly like um, I think that's once. I think this is um one of those games where um, you could clearly see like Kevin Durant literally gave it, everything he had on in that game seven and unfortunately it came up just short. I got more to say, but Michael, Alex, turn it over to you. Honestly, for me, Kevin Durant has nothing to be ashamed of. That was a great, that was the, one of the greatest basketball games I've ever seen played in my life. Kevin Durant, who's probably the best scorer in NBA history. I'm saying that. He's better scored than Michael Jordan. And Jordan is the greatest of all time. The Nets have nothing to be ashamed of. You guys waited a year for Kevin Durant to be healthy. You guys got him. This is what it took you to. We don't know where James Harden is going to leave. You know what I mean? For this offseason. I just want to sign him. If I were the Nets, get rid of Joe Harris. Joe Harris got to get off the team. Like, you know what I mean? Joe Harris disgraced me watching the Nets. Oh, my God. Adam, I know you. But uh, if I had to to the Bucks, that was a hell of a game. Because here's the thing: Giannis finally got to the Eastern Conference Finals in, in the last two years. If he doesn't lose, if he doesn't win, he can't say he's the greatest player in this in this decade. Because I, they had high hopes for high hopes for him. 
Honestly, I don't see the Bucks winning championship out of the East. They're not making it out of the East. I'm saying how the Hawks been playing. I mean, we'll yeah. we'll, we'll discuss that later on. But that's just a different story. But yeah. but the Nets played great. Took their hat out. Steve Nash. But I, only reason why they didn't win, Adam. Yeah. They don't, they don't got that. They, they don't got that lockdown defender for the playoff team. And Nash I, is a I, seven. I, I think there's many reasons why it went. And number one, I gotta get to uh, the elephant in the room, and that is Joe Harris. I mean, this guy, like throughout the regular season, and and, and even like early on, I think what was it, game one or game two, and the Suck series, he was lights out for the Nets. He was like, um, he literally established himself as one of the best uh, shooters in the league. And from game three on, he was nowhere in this series. He was absolutely terrible, and. If there's one guy that you want to say, this is the reason why the Nets lost this game. I think Joe Harris has to be like, has to be that guy. I mean, you guys remember um, in overtime with 55 seconds left, yeah. Joe Harris has a wide open three, a wide open three that, like, if that nine times out of ten he makes it, except for um, he has this wide open three and. He misses it. Is it the Nets are what I believe what up by two, with like fifty seconds left. If Joe Harris makes that three, they have a five point lead and the game's basically over. But of course, Joe Harris, like being so ice cold, misses it and Giannis goes on the, and then the Bucks go on to um win the game and. For the first just, four it's games, just, it's just a it's just, and. It's just depressing. I got to get on Steve Nash for something. I got to get on uh, Steve Nash. I want to give a shout out to um, a, a, a um, basketball YouTuber who goes by the name of Nets Boy. I don't know. I don't know if you guys are. I'm sure most of you have never heard. have never listened to like I have never heard of him. Um, go search up Nets Boy right now on YouTube. He, he makes excellent Nets content. And like he makes excellent Nets. He makes great Nets videos. Um, he brought up a really great point about the coaches, Steve Nash. Like, the, throughout the enti- throughout this entire game, throughout the entire series, he was going with basically, what, a six-man, six-seven-man rotation? Like, in game seven, like, I, I'm, I mean, I, I'm not sure, like, exactly how well he sprout the minutes, but with Joe Howe struggling that badly, why is it Landry Shamit seeing more minutes? Why is it Tyler Johnson seeing more minutes? Why isn't uh Nicholas Claxton seeing more minutes? Because clearly, like um, they're only like um, because clearly they're throwing out um Blake Griffin to guard Giannis, which obviously, like I wouldn't necessarily call it a mismatch, but we could clearly see who has the advantage there. I mean, I I, I mean, uh, so we didn't give enough minutes to um. So why uh, why isn't he giving enough misses, guys? Why is he like, why was he like, uh, oh let me let me bring up the box score for you guys so I can show you guys the miss. This is just this is game seven. In game seven, um, the net starters, starters um played like um um also again like Kevin Durant had fifty minutes, Blake Griffin had forty minutes, Joris had forty seven minutes. Bruce Brown had um 52 minutes and James Harden had 53 minutes. Why is Jeff Green only getting 13 minutes? Why is Nicholas Claxton not even getting a minute? Why is Landry Sharon not only getting seven minutes? And why is it why is it Tyler Johnson, Mike James? Why it why did um Steve Nash like constantly throw his throw his other, especially the ones who were who were struggling with Joe Harris was struggling that badly. You got to give Landry Sharon some um, looks because he is by far like one of the better shooters on. I think with Joe Harris struggling, Landry Sharon could easily could have been the guy to get hot in his place. And and another thing, to guard Giannis, that's defensive issues, as you mentioned, Michael. Where was DeAndre Jordan in this series? Did DeAndre Jordan play one minute this series? I believe he didn't. I mean, that is just in my opinion, that's completely like unacceptable. Like, I, and I'm not the biggest DeAndre Jordan fan. I think like I think what he brings to this team is very is like I think what he brings to this team is very limited. But 
as a big, he's still like, um, that's the reason why he's still on the scene to be that big body, to be that big center, to be that um physical force that could go up against like Giannis and like be that rim protector. And he doesn't see a minute in this series. I don't know. I just, I just think that was uh, just some um, very questionable coaching decisions by Steve Nash. So not necessarily blaming the loss directly on him, but I'd be lying if I if I said that um there um weren't like um some questionable um rotation decisions. There was a lot of decisions. And I mean, but and honestly, like going forward for the Nets, I mean, when you look back on this season, like. It's hard to call it a failure because we all because this thing we can nitpick like Steve Nash. We can get on Joe Harris for being a bum in this series. We could get on Kevin Durant's foot being on the line. At the end of the day, the you, know, you want to know the real reason that that's lost the series. What's the real reason, brother? Because because half of the big three was out. That's the reason why it's lost the series. Kyrie Irving only played like um game one and like and was out of game two. So Kyrie Irving basically didn't play a series and James Harden basically and James Harden played on and basically played on one leg this series. So that's ultimately the reason why um the the, the Nets lost. And I said like at the time, like with all three of the big three are healthy, the Nets are literally unbeatable. There's not a single team, at least right now in the NBA, that could beat them. When two of the big three are healthy, when when two of the big three are are healthy, they're very heavy title favorites. Like, like there's like even with just two of the big three healthy and all their role players, like they're still like one of, if not the favorite, to win the NBA title. But with just one of the big three healthy, with just one of them out there fully healthy, I'm sorry, the Milwaukee Bucks are simply a better team. Like with Giannis and Chris and and beyond, like, obviously Kevin Durant is, like, the best player in the series. He's the best player, in my opinion, in the planet right now. But aside from that, aside from that, who did the Nets have behind him? They had James Harden on one leg. They had Joe Harris, who couldn't make a shot to save his life. And, I mean, you got Blake Griffin and Bruce Brown, some really nice guys that could play. But but then you compare it to what the Bucks have behind Giannis. You have, Giannis, you have Chris Milton. You have... PJ Tucker, you have Drew Holiday. You got some guys that can really back up you. Know, so, with one, the, with only one of the big three fully healthy, I'm sorry, the Bucks are simply just a better team than that. And, and I think the Milwaukee Bucks proved it. That they, um, and I think that was just proven. The Milwaukee Bucks, like, with just one of the big three healthy, the Milwaukee Bucks is just simply the better team. They were the better team. I mean, simple. so going so going forward for the Nets, I mean, what's going to happen? Uh, we know that Spencer Dinwiddie like just recently opted out, opted out of his his contract, so he's going to be free agent. He had a player option, he declined it, so he's going to be a free agent. Don't know what the Nets are going to do with him. I'll, I'll we'll probably I'll save that for another episode. But I don't know if you recently heard this. All three of the Nets' big three are currently available for contract extensions. If I'm Sean Marks, that's priority number one this offseason. Getting Kyrie Irving locked up long term. Getting James Harden locked up long term. Getting Kevin Durant locked up long term. Get all three of these guys extended. I think that needs to be like the Nets um biggest biggest priority going to offseason. Along with um, we'll see what the Nets decide to do with Joe Harris. I mean, even I don't know about you guys, but I've heard a lot of people saying like that I should trade him. I'm not will, I'm not sure if I'm willing to go that far, but we'll but we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll see what that's doing. I mean, I mean Sean Mark recently spoke at a press conference and at, at the season ending press conference, and it doesn't sound like he's he's gonna be shopping Joe Harris, but I don't know. We'll see. But again, like they need to, like if he can get like make sure you get that extension with the big three done, cause I believe their contracts like. They're under contract for next season, but then and after next season they could all opt out. So getting like them extended like has to be priority number one. And see if you can, I mean, um, see if you can bring back some of the uh, um, the role players that keep the screw set. See if you can bring back Blake Griffin. See if you can bring back um, at the, 
I is Lynch Shamrock a free agent? I think Jeff Green's a free agent, so bring back him. But make sure you bring back some of you guys. See if you can get like um a a big man. See if you can get like a a, a wing defender like um. And I think this team, like, if you get the big three healthy and you and you give them enough like, and you give them enough support, like this team is gonna be. This team is obviously going to be like very, very dangerous heading into 2022, the 2021-2022 season. Alex, you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I'm interested to see if the Nets make any, any, uh, Big, huge trades during the off season, and and I'm, yeah, I think that um, it's gonna be interesting to see uh, if they keep Joe Harris or or go the other route of getting another deep threat shooter, but I'm not sure. Because I'm I'm not the Brooklyn uh, president, and it's not it's going to take some time for them to to get their ideas right and see what they need to do before uh, the trade deadline comes around. And I just think that they they have all the pieces. It's just that. Can can they go ahead and bring in another shooter that can have the ability, just like Joe Harris? Yeah. I mean the the thing that let's see two things like uh, obviously AD needs to get the big three extended. That's priority number one. But if there's two things they need aside from that, at, um, it would be um they need to get the big three uh, extended, fully healthy. Number one, but. If there's anything they need besides that, it's a like they need like more help on the defensive like wing. And they 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 need, like a defensive wing. And another thing they need is um they need um they need a big body. That's what they need. They really need like that that big body like at the center position. Um, and we'll see what maybe Nick maybe um maybe Nick Nicholas Clark saying like takes a huge step forward and, and like fills in that void like for the net it's like or maybe they go out there and they find someone via trade or something um I mean we'll, we'll see what we'll see what happens for the nets going forward but but that's all we're gonna that's all we're gonna touch upon the nets for now um but so now now that I've had my time to share my misery it's time for my friend Alex here to get a chance to um, share his misery as the 70 as as that the Nets are eliminated, and the 76ers were eliminated along with the Nets at the at the hands of the Atlanta Hawks. So, Alex, my friend, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, this is this comes from my heart and what I really think about this team heading into next season. Um, I just th- I just think that keeping Ben Simmons for for the rest of the playoffs this season has been a complete beyond fail, and I I don't know what to do with. I mean, if I'm Daryl Moy, which is the Sixers president. I would look into trade offers and see what's best available for him. I just, honestly, I I don't think he can fix his shooting issue. And it's going to be a problem if he keeps his foot with the Sixers. Uh, And I don't see him being a great asset to the team. And I've, I've been listening to Philadelphia Sports Talk Radio all week and people really want 
a trade which is which involves either CJ McConnum or D'Angelo Russell. And I'm I'm not people are very optimistic about that conversation and I'm a, I'm interested to see where that goes where the when the time comes. I just I just think that even if they beat the Hawks in that series, they, they wouldn't have the ability to to have a NBA finals experience this year because the lack of of production of the Sixers offense yeah. is is really out of control and and another thing that I heard is Ben Simmons is immature and he's I, I yeah I, I think I think Stephen A mentioned that first take right about Ben Simmons because yeah. here's I, the thing here's the thing when we could get yeah. on Joe Harris like for for um the choke job he he had in the series. If what Joe Harris did was a choke job, then what Ben Simmons is is like a like gag way concert, worse. if you will. It was way worse. Ben, I don't know what happened with Ben Simmons, boys. Ben Simmons was near the hoop, literally wide open. Passes or wide open shot. You're two feet away from the hoop. What the heck? was Ben Simmons thinking? What the bloody heck was Ben Simmons doing? All right, come on. I ten, wish, times, it, not, ten times out of ten, people are putting that in the hoop. Honestly. I think, I think he's just afraid to do whatever he would want to do with the ball. I don't give a damn. You are six foot ten. You are the, or If God gives you a wide open layup, you take it. You take it. It's common sense. You take it. It's called basketball one-on-one. I know the Sixers fans are stupid when it comes to it because including Ben Simmons, who's the player. Honestly, for me, Ben Simmons needs to go back to Australia and learn how to play basketball again because, for example, a certain guy in this podcast by the name of Adam Grisani doesn't, doesn't know what the word pass means, but, but at least he knows when to shoot. Same, you big boy scout, you fed up for you Sixers boy scout over there. You know how to shoot when you're wide open. It's called common sense. Point is, Ben Simmons, you're making millions and millions of dollars to put a bat to put the ball in the hoop. Motherfucker, just do it. Christ. Alex, you have something uh, yeah. to say? Yeah. So, the Sixers president, Dale Murray addressed the media earlier today and there's this tweet that I would like to uh, to talk about um, it says Dale Murray when asked directly whether Ben Simmons will be a six season his answer was any move that will help our team win and approve our odds to win the championship we will look at and do what it makes sense he prefaced it saying that it wasn't suspe- specific to Ben Simmons. Yeah, I definitely think, like, um, I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll get into the offseason talk, like, in another episode. But long story short, guys, I don't – I I would be, like, um, I would not be surprised at all if Ben Simmons is not a 76er by, um, next season. I just don't think his chemistry fits Joel Embiid. And, yeah. And it's it's really disappointing to see. But at the same time, I just think that it's, it's right for them to move on and get a high deep threat shooter in this year's draft and, and have that maturity in what Tyrese Maxey has because he's been more legit than Ben Simmons when it comes to shooting. And I just think that they need one one more solid shooter like him to get 
to get everything going in this offensive part of this team. And I think that it's going to look a ton different if they move on with Ben Simmons. And it's just that I'm not sure what will come in the offers and how much the Sixers have to get rid of with Ben Simmons and some of the other pieces that might come with it. And I think that that will be a huge, huge story when the time comes. And it's going to look a ton a lot different if it happens. But I just think that the, the whole organization needs to re- refresh everything and start over no matter if they keep Simmons or not. I mean, if they keep Simmons, then you would have to look into a great deep threat shooter, like maybe another Tobias Harris or or someone like him. But it's it's gonna be a, a long off season and I just I'm I'm kind of worried about Ben Simmons and his future with in the NBA. Like I've once he stepped on the court in South Philadelphia, the first time he was a sixer, I I felt really confident in him, seeing his highlights from LSU, and it just it breaks my heart to say that I can't I can't. Uh, have have faith in this guy and you know they need to move on with whatever they need to do to be successful couldn't have said much better myself alex i mean both our teams like we're gonna are heading to very interesting off seasons all right boys your teams are playing golf like my teams are right now we playing golf right now. yeah could <laughs> you have imagined um Guys, if I told you at the beginning of the playoffs that the Lakers, Sixers, and Nets wouldn't be playing the Eastern Conference Finals, would you? You guys would all call me crazy. I would have been like, "What kind of weed are you smoking?" <laughs> yeah. Well, guys. All right. So, so guess what? It's time for uh, what pun am I going to use this time? You make, make you you got to make up for it, Adam. All right, all right, all right. I got I got I got to think of something. I got to think of something. It's time for. The segment of the episode that that is like a vacuum and that it cleans up all the shit that is called Mike's Hot Take. Michael Cunningham, take it away. Thank you, brother Adam. You know what, boys? I was thinking about, you know, what kind of what kind of hot take would I have? I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna I'm gonna change it up today. This is about basketball. I'm going to talk about the greatest playoff role player performer I ever see play in my life. You know who I'm. You know who I'm going to say. Like not an all star, not a superstar, not a great player, a great role player. I'm going to say if you got like to your viewers out there who remembers a guy named by the name of Robert Ory. Let's see, you guys. Every team he played for, he won a championship for. He won a championship. He played for the Lakers, not Rockets first, Lakers. And then he played for the Spurs. I want to see how many championships he won. He won some championships. I got it. He won seven championships. Two with uh, Houston. They played for four teams. Two with Houston. One, two with three with the Lakers, and then two with the Spurs. This brother knew how to win. You know what I'm saying? The brother knew how to win. He knew how to win championships, boys. You know what I mean, Adam? Yeah, I definitely hear what you're saying. Robert Ory, who had, like, the greatest playoff performances ever. Who remembers? I don't think y'all going to remember this. I remember it was 2002, Lakers versus Kings in the Western Conference Finals, game four. Kobe, are y'all probably heard not seen the highlight? Kobe on the move, misses the layup. Shaq tries to tip it in. 
Shaq tips it out, and Vladdy tips it out all the way to Ori. Ori for three, Ori for the win. Goes in. Like, he was like a playoff performer, brother. He was stuck in the regular season, but when that bright lights, like Robert Ori had at least, at least over at least five, ten great performances. I say that's probably the greatest player performer I've ever seen play. You, you helped Akeem win a championship. Kobe and Shaq win a championship. You were coached by probably the greatest, two of the greatest basketball coaches in NBA, not three. Really, Tom, uh, you had Phil Jackson with the Lakers, and you had Greg Popovich with the Spurs, and you played with probably the two best centers in the NBA of all time in Akeem and Shaq, the greatest power forward in NBA history, and Tim Duncan. And you play with probably the second best shooting guard ever to play the game of basketball, which is my idol, Mr. The late great Kobe Bean Bryant. So, boys, we every NBA player needed a Robert Ory in the playoffs. You know what I mean, Adam? You need that one good role player that can step up with the All Stars and superstars. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because in the playoffs, your all your superstars can't win every game for you. Yet you have it's a twelve man it's a twelve basketball it's a twelve man sport, usually ten to eight to ten player sport. It's from the coaching staff to the players. You gotta know your versatility. You gotta know your you gotta know your thing. Sorry, viewers. Alex has to go to the potty because he's not potty trained yet. <laughs> so, Michael, Adam, th- let's be respectful here. Let's be respectful. <laughs> Sorry, Adam had to leave too. He uh, his, his 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 woman called him. To the viewers, sorry, viewers. Adam is in a serious relationship. Sorry, sorry to all the uh, girls out there on the show. <laughs> Adam's a very, very taken serious man. Oh, Mike, I did not have to go to the bathroom. I just had to grab a drink. Sorry, Alex, yeah, I hey. just had to grab a drink. Give him a break, Michael. <laughs> hey, I know you two aren't potty trained, but that's a different part of my hot take. But the point is. You need to have a great role player to be in the NBA for an NBA team. For example, Jordan had Paxson. LeBron had, had Ray Allen. Kobe had Ori and Ron Artest. Duncan had, like, like you got to have a great role player. The Lakers had Michael Cooper. You just got to have a good role player, going to energize the player. To help you start a run, and by at the end of this, this was Mike's hot take, and I'm saying Robert Ory is probably the greatest playoff role player in my opinion of all time. If y'all looking up, look at his highlights. To all the get your game on viewers and podcast followers, look up, watch Robert Ory's playoff performances, top ten. You see what I'm talking about, and this is my hot take. Thank you. All right, thank you for that awesome hot take there. Um, Alex, you want to go ahead? Any questions? Anything you approve or disapprove? Go ahead. I approve. I approve it too. So congratulations, Michael. You are, I think that's her, what's the 24th approval now. Congratulations. So I'm on the hot street, baby. But now we got to talk some baseball and... Uh, before, I'll, I'll get to the Yankees in a second because I got a lot of thoughts on them, but I have to say this sticky stuff, this this thing where they're always checking pitchers mid-game and like what they did with Max Scherzer, what they did with Jacob deGrom, I think it's a joke. I think that is just like I mean, like for a sport that is always like um for a sport that is like trying to promote like pace of play that's that's one of the big issues like with baseball trying to grasp a new um this a new generation is they try to fix the pace of play like speed up the game like the game's too slow how is this how is this like um you like everyone plays that how um, slow baseball is right you think this this is just like the icy on the cake the have like um, have umpires go up there and search and basically um strip searching of the Grom. I mean, 
I think I could have used better terminology there, but don't you guys agree? I think, like, I just think that MLB could have handled this situation, like, with pictures and sticky stuff so much better than what, what they're doing right now. I think what they've created right now is just a complete another shit bomb because, like, again, this is always a rule that pitchers aren't allowed to use these type of substances. Um, they're allowed to use substances to get a better grip on the ball, but they're not allowed to use substances that, um, like, increase their spin rate and could give them, like, an unfair advantage. So this is always real, but now LB's Feinstein with, um, with the, like, uh, with, like, what the dead balls of, the, on, like, two offenses around the league, LB's finally starting to get their head out of their ass, ass and try to finally enforce, like, their own r- rules. And this is how they're enforcing it. Like, they have enough pace of play issues already. And, and like, now, I was just going to do, like, to the product of the sport. I mean, I said before, I said, and I said this before, this could have easily been handled if both, like, MLB and the Players Association could just come together Let's find a substance that we can agree that pitchers can use. That that can use um. Cut. Let's let's find a legal substance that all pitchers can use that help them get better grip on the ball. Ball also doesn't give them an unfair advantage. Let's just let's let pitchers just let's just let let's let pitchers just do that and bam, problem solved. But no, they have to make a complete circus out of it. I mean. I'll, Michael Axe, Ax, I see you have your hand raised there. Go ahead. Uh, so, I so thought tonight was a very eventful night in Major League Baseball with this situation. Uh, first off, in the Phillies Nationals game, Joe Girardi, uh, I, th- I don't think he got ejected. I'm, Did he I get forget. ejected? I, I, I feel like he did, but he he kept yelling at Max Scherzer because he thought that there was something suspicious with him touching his hat. And I'm not sure if he, he didn't have anything that that they were looking for, but it was a very tough situation and I don't think either side uh, made made it very smooth, and and it was just a bad look in that game, and I just think that it's a, it's uh, just a bad situation overall, and and things things like that can't can't happen often. And another thing that is on my mind is it was in the Oakland game, Oakland against, I think it's against the Texas Rangers. And the Oakland pitcher had to literally uh, take his belt off and pull down his pants halfway. Exactly. Yeah, which is, which I is mean, unbelievably annoying. I mean, like, like it's just I, a complete, complete mess, right, Alex? Yeah, yeah. This is this is what slows the game, and I've I've been hearing people talking about how slow of the game of baseball is nowadays. And this is just getting worse and worse as the days go on. And I'm not sure how how things are going to be in the future with this. And I think I I heard this on ESPN yesterday. Someone said, I think it was on Baseball Tonight. So someone said that they should not have done this starting in in the middle of the season and they should just uh waited the whole thing out the rest of the season and start start with this in this 
uh, start of 2022 season. And it's just a complete nonsense mess with this. And and I'm not even it, – it's hard to point in words of what MLB is going to go forward and doing with this. And it's terrible to see what – what is happening, but it's the reality of today. And I mean, I just, I'm just speechless uh, to say what's next. I mean, it's just a complete mess. And we all know why, like, um, I mean, it's just, we all know, uh, all like, um, Again, this could easily be solved by both LB and the Players Association agreeing on a substance that that could be used for pitchers to get better grip on the ball. Because, because I say players getting a grip on the better grip on the ball is important because it helps the if they if they do that it like um, reduces the risks of them losing control and potentially like hitting a batter. So, so it does help like promote like the safety of the game. So I can understand that. So. Why can't like both the uh, us players association and the and the league come up with a substance that can help pitchers get a better grip on the ball, but also not give them an unfair advantage by increasing their spin rates? So, but again, like we all know, we all know this: the MLB and the owners and the players relationship is at an all-time low, and all this stuff is just it's basically negotiating tactics for the upcoming CBA, which, which, which. This is we're not gonna be talking about this for like a bunch of episodes right now, but uh, like this is something with we're talking about like way on in the future. But all I have to say is be pre- for for the upcoming MLB CBA negotiations, guys. Be prepared for an absolute shit show. That's all I'm gonna say. I mean, Michael, you have anything anything the thoughts on what you're saying? You just agree with us. 100% agree with Shaq Cats. All right. All right, so we'll talk some we'll um we'll talk a little bit of Yankees um for, for a minute. Um Yankees actually uh they're playing good. I mean they're they're playing Barely. like I mean they're, they're playing um de- they're playing a decent I believe they what well, they've won like what five out of the last six? I'm sorry, five out of the last seven because unfortunately they could unfortunately they lost today to um the uh was it Kansas City Royals? So I'm pretty sure, like our good friend Chris is enjoying that. But here's the one thing. Here's the one takeaway I have about the Yankees. Here's the one takeaway. Actually, actually, it's this too. It's this too, and it, and, and it ha- has something like to do with uh, today's game. Gary Sanchez has an unbelievable. The, this guy, like, um, and I'm gonna admit, I'm gonna admit. I'm I'm not his biggest fan. I've been I've been a, a Gary Sanchez crick, if you, if you will, because here's the thing. Because the guy, like in recent years, like has just been the definition of inconsistent. In 2018, stunk up the, the entire year. In 2019, had an excellent first half and then fell off in the second half. And we all know how bad he was in 2020. <laughs> And and he's and it started like out the same from in the start of 2021. And it looked like more the same. He only hit fastball, like um he couldn't hit over to over the Mendoza line to save his life. It just looked like same old disappointing Gary Sanchez. But the guy, like, I don't know, like have you guys seen what he's done like over the past like what was it um 20 games now? So this is not like some I mean, it's still technically a small sample size, but over the past three games, I believe he's hitting over 300. I believe his like slugging percentage is like his slugging percentage is like um what, over 600. His OPS is off the charts. I mean, the guy has just is just finally starting to figure out how to play as a Yankees fan. I could be happy. I said before, I've never been like um. A pom poms waving guy for Gary Sanchez, but I've always said the guy has always had the talent. I never ever once questioned like Gary Sanchez's talent. Talent wise, like I said at it like um on Twitter, I said on his podcast, Gary Sanchez, like um 
at his best is like just as dangerous of a bat as Aaron Judge John Carl Stanton. He's that level of a dangerous threat at the Yankees in the Yankees lineup when he's on. But unfortunately, but unfortunately, he just like the recent and recently the consistency hasn't been there. But now he's finally starting to get his swing back. Now he's finally starting to um get his like rhythm back in. I just it could I could be at happier to see. I mean, I've got more stuff to say, but Michael, like, you wanted to add something? You nailed it right on the head for me, man. But the, but the Yankees are playing good baseball right now. Um, Stanton has been playing great. But Sanchez, he, he's killing me. He's killing it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, our pitching, our, we, our ace, Garrett Cole, is playing good. We have, Adam, in my opinion, we have the best team on paper. But I don't know how that, the, they're, they're one of the best teams in baseball on paper, yeah. But I don't know how we can't put it on the field. Yeah, the, I mean, um, they, the Yanks have been playing better baseball as, as of late. Hold on, let me, let me check. Um, they've won of. Uh, they uh they took two out of three from Oakland. They swept the Blue Jays. So I mean they lost. So they they're like um. By I me mean, like um they've been playing a lot better baseball. They really have. Now getting back to the topic of Gary Sanchez is that this past game against the Royals, which which um unfortunately saw six to five. I've, we're all looking forward to seeing Nicky lineup because with Gary Cole on the mound, like and with how Gary Sanchez has been hitting, you figure that like, Gary Sanchez might be in the lineup. But here's the thing: Gary Sanchez wasn't in the lineup. It was instead Gary Cole's now, I guess you could call him personal catcher. Kyle I got Joker, and I did not like that move one bit because, and for multiple reasons. Number one. I love Garrett Cole, and I, I generally, he's one of my favorite players on the Yankees. Like, love watching him play, love his competitive spirit. Like, I love everything about Garrett Cole, but I'm sorry. With Gary Sanchez hitting this hot, with Gary Sanchez finally starting to figure it out, I'm sorry. Aaron Boone, you've, you've got to tell Garrett Cole the man of and finally, like, this just personal catch and offense with Kyle and Josh Joker and have him be. And have um uh, have like Gary Sanchez catch him, like enough is enough with like um like Cole on this personal catcher BS with Kyle Higash Yoker. Now Higash Yoker did hit a home run today, so so like um so ultimately turned out to be the right move. So I'll give so I'll give Booney and and them a, a, a pass for this one. But going forward, or if Gary Sanchez continues to hit it. If Gary Sanchez continues to hit at this level, I'm sorry. Like, he has to be the everyday catcher going forward. That's even when Cole pitches. I mean, Garrett Cole's going to have to, sooner rather than later, Garrett Cole's going to have to learn to pitch to Gary Sanchez. I, I don't know what – it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. If Gary Sanchez continues to – if Gary Sanchez continues to hit this up, to, uh, he, if Gary Sanchez continues to hit like this. It's just that simple. It is just that simple. And coming to this game, like um, a reason why I think it was a very poor or a decision coming in was you, you, you're going to rest Gary Sanchez today. Then, so I, so that means Gary Sanchez is going to be playing the next day. Then like um, on two, thir- Thursday is the day game, which, which um, get, you assume like day game after a night game, like, they he's normally rest like Gary Sanchez that day. So, out of two of these three games, you're not going to start like one of your hottest batters, and that, in my opinion, like is like it's just like um very bad managing managing like bamboo. Unless like unless Gary Sanchez DHs on Thursday, but then guess what? You're saying John Carlos Stanton. So, I mean, I don't know. I just think like I just think like Gary Sanchez. Kyle Cox Sugar did hit a home run, so it all worked out in the end. So I'm just gonna, so I'm just gonna let this one go. But eventually, like, um, 
Amber was got to tell Garrett Cole, hey, you're going to eventually have to pitch to Gary Sanchez. Enough of this pro Ursula Cadger BS. Michael, Alex. This reminds me of the Randy Johnson and Jorge Posada thing back in the day. Because Randy Johnson didn't like pitching to Jorge Posada. When they had John Flattery, they are doing the same crap with the Yankees. If you're the ace of – I can understand you want to have your own personal catcher, but say like that catcher gets hurt, you have to pitch to your to your go-to catcher. So I don't know – who you said it was the problem, Adam Cole? Who, who needs a personal catcher? Uh, Garrett Cole. Garrett Cole, like, um, had his – Kyle Higashioka was Garrett Cole's personal – has been Garrett Cole's personal catcher. I don't know why, you know, first of all, Gary Sanders is a better catcher, but if it makes the team win, it makes the team win. Think about it. Yeah. I mean, Alex, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I think that – I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to say as a Philadelphia sports fan. It just I feel like the Yankees have been like inconsistent with the their at bats and they've been they've been hitting less than they want to. And I just think that I mean, I don't know. It's it's just hard to point words of what the team really is. Yeah, I mean, they've been playing well as of lately. They had they they really have. I mean, I mean, this was a rough loss to the Royals. I mean, don't get me wrong, but aside from that, they've been playing well. So we'll see if they can keep this up. We'll see, like, if uh, if they if they can keep this up going forward. So, I mean, that's really all I have to say about the Yankees for now. Um. Before we get to before we get to our bets, I do want to bring up this story. Did you guys hear about um the um Carl Nassib story? Yeah, man. Becoming, so becoming the becoming the first like active NFL player to come out at, to come out as gay. Yeah, you we support on the Get Your Game On podcast. Adam, sorry to cut you off. We definitely. I mean, we um, don't we don't no, hate well, if you're black. That, we don't hate if you're white. We don't we don't care if you're gay, lesbian, or straight. We support every athlete. Exactly. We, exactly. There's no we don't do races here. And if exactly. you guys are racist, pop uh, if, viewers are racist. We don't we don't we don't want your business. It, we don't support. Just, yeah, just so you guys know, if if any of you listen to this podcast, like are racist, like um, transphobic, homophobic, whatever the case may be, this podcast isn't for you. That's all we're gonna say. One of my closest friends in my inner circle is gay, and I love the dad, Patrick yeah. Joseph. What, what, one one of my, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's our brother, Patrick. If you're listening to this, like we support you. Um, one of my best friends from elementary school, like on that size, is gay as well. Um, but but, but but to get back to Carl Nassib, like I'm surprised it took this long for um an active NFL player to come out. I'm I thought they would come out sooner. I thought they would come out sooner. Yeah, I, I, when I heard that it was the first, I'm like, I could have sworn that um, that like someone else like came out earlier. Like I could have sworn. So the fact that it's been the first like player to come out as gay, like I found that a little surprise. And that's taking us all, but nevertheless, the day is here. And like, and Carl Nassif, if you're listening to this podcast, we salute you, we support you. And I don't know if you guys saw this on uh, like Fan X, but. Carl Nassib's jersey has been like the highest selling NFL jersey, and I was thinking, you know what? I couldn't be happier. I mean, I mean, Alex, you got anything to say? Uh, yeah, I I support anyone in Carl's position, and and it's awesome to to hear this kind of news and I just want everyone to be be free with their say and 
can't and and also don't don't hesitate to say anything that you think will be embarrassing because at the end of the day it's about your greater health and and your wellness of of doing things and it's just a big topic for everyone to understand and I'm just glad that that this is happening yeah. more often and I just feel like it's it's definitely a great story to yeah. put the start of this. Yeah, it's def- definitely a very like great story. Um, so shout shout out to Kalnasa, salute to Kalnasa, and you know, <laughs> so we really say we su- we um support gay rights, and you know, what? as 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 we as you like to say, love is love. That's all. That's all I really gotta say. So, moving on to our bets of the episode, and to recap last week, uh, last episode, episode twenty six. Guess what? Every what? single one of us lost except for one, and that's me. That's right. Michael, my friend, was the only one last episode to take a W. Michael had the Clippers over the Jazz, as on my line, and Paul George over 20. Both of those happened, that his same game parlay paid off, and he and he won his bet. But everyone else lost. I had the Nets over the Bucks in Game 7, so y'all know how that ended. Alex had the Red Sox over the Royals. Royals beat the Red Sox. David had the Golden Knights over the Canadians. Canadians beat the Golden Knights. Chris had the Nets over the Bucks money line. And we all know how that ended. And Marcellus had the Mets over the Nationals on the money line. And and he lost that bet as well. So to give you an update on the standings. Guys, we have a new Ringleader. We have a new champion right now. We have a new ringleader in the house, guys. My good friend, Michael Cunningham, is currently right now sitting in first place, 14 12 record, 125.89 points. I love my job. <laughs> All Who's, right. Adam, say it one more time. Say it again. Michael, you are in first place. <laughs> Adam, this is killing you, isn't it, buddy? Only on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Alex, is this killing you too, Alex? I'm in first place. Yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> all right, so I mean Dave is in second place, 17 and 9 record, 123.02 points. Chris is in third place, 12 and 14 record, 114.76 points. I'm in fourth place, 11 and 15 record. I've lost like fourth straight bet. 11 and 15 record, 113.22 points. Marcellus is in fifth place, 15 and 11 record, 89.03 points. And Alex, my friend, with his seventh straight loss. 917 record, 53.75 points. So, me and Alex, my friend, are on some cold streaks. <laughs> Alex, can you get a win, brother? I pray that you get a win. Seven, seven straight L's, L's, brother. What a shame. What a pity. Alex, who, who's in first place again? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so time to make our bets. Um, we do have a uh, David's bet right here. Um, th- David is picking the Lightning over the Islanders in Game Seven and then Game Six. So that's uh, that's David's bet. So uh, I- I'm gonna go. Do we have a uh, Marcellus's bet? I'm gonna pick for him. 
All right, so Michael, you're going to pick once again, pick for him again, and I'm going to pick for Chris. So I'm going to go first. And you know what? David, if you're listening to this podcast, this episode, I'm going to challenge David on head to head. I'm going to go with the Islanders over the Lightning in game six of the of um, the uh, Stanley Cup semifinals. I think like the Islanders with their backs against the wall in, my, in what might be like the final game at Nassau Coliseum. You know, their, their last home game, the last home game, I think they're going to come out fighting. I think, um, I think they're going to, um, even though they like had this bad loss and we don't know what's going to happen with Matthew Barzell, is he going to play? Is he, is he not? But as of right now, I, I believe he's going to pull He's Is he going to, I believe like, like um, he is going to play. The league's not going to suspend him. I, don't, I mean, I, I, that's at least my take um, on the whole situation, but I've got the Islanders over the Lightning on the money line in Game Six. All right, Alex, my friend, you're up. Okay. In the words of Charles Barkley, I guarantee this will be a dub. Well, Preach on, brother. What is it? Okay. Uh, since I'm on a seven game division streak and I I got my ways of turning this around, I am going to go with Milwaukee Brewers money line. Milwaukee Brewers money line. You know what? I don't hate it. That's a smart bet. Good job, Mijo. All right. For Chris's bet, I'm going to go for him. And you know what? I am. <laughs> I am gonna take um the Bucks on the spread. Bucks are minus seven and a half right now, so I'm gonna take that and buck yeah, Bucks on the spread in game one. All right. Michael, you're gonna do Marcellus's right now? Yeah. Go ahead. Bucks over Hawks. Giannis giving a double double. All right. I don't think we could do double double though, so it has to be like um. You allowed to do a double? I I I I I'm not I'm not sure if that's available on same me par or like. It's the same game parlay. Trust me. All right. If if it isn't, I'll just put down like Giannis scoring twenty five or more. All right. All right. If it isn't, all right. And for yours truly. All right. Last up, Michael. Bring the heat. As you can see, my friend, I have. You know, Adam, I was thinking about thinking about my, my, my idol, the late great Kobe. And there was an article that said Devin Booker is turning into a new Kobe Bryant. You, let me, you know what? I believe it. I am going to Suns for game three. Devin Booker, 25 points or more. Now, can you dig that sucker? All right. So, Michael's going with the Suns over the Clippers. And Devin Booker, 25 or more. Yeah, that's in the bag. The brother's been averaging 40 points, 30, 25, 30 points a game. No question. All right. All right. So that's all for our bets. And that's all for this episode. Before we log off here, um, we want to wish like all the dads out there. We hope we all enjoyed like your Father's Day weekend. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. And especially to my dad, if you're listening, I love you. And same with you, Dad. You know you annoy me. I still love you. <laughs> Alex, you want to go ahead? All right. I would like to wish my dad a happy Father's Day. And I know that you had the blast. Yeah. All right. So, any final thoughts, Alex or Michael? Nope. Uh, nope. All right. That's it. This has been episode 27 of the Get Game of Podcast with yours truly, Am Grisani, Michael Cunningham, Alex Reach, Dick, Ava Heller, 
I'm sorry. This has been episode 27 of the Gay Game Podcast with yours truly, Adam Grassani, Mike Cunningham, and Alex Reed. If you heard, leave a like and follow or subscribe to our podcast. Also, if you're going to join the conversation, drop a comment or review, or you may feature it in a feature episode by my friends. Those who reduce your fancy. You can measure a world, believe in it, and die of it. See you next time, and until then, stay lit. Hey, hello.